Start out with Carlos again. Okay. Ciara had to go teach class. Is that right? Yeah. So um, okay. really cool. Uh, some of the students get to teach the summer session. Uh, so Ciara had a conflict of teaching class, but Carlos is here to teach us, talk to us about data scholars. Good. Okay. Hi everyone. Nice to see you all again. So I'm Carlos. Um, aside from teaching Data Eight here at Berkeley for now, it's total of two years. One of my main responsibilities with Ciara this past year, so fall 21 and spring 22, was to build our data scholars program to new heights. So data scholars, um, we'll talk about it in a bit, but the program itself has existed here at Berkeley, I believe since around like 2017. However, the program itself had no real format, had no real instructional staff. Um, it was a work in progress, right? Starting from the ground zero. And it wasn't until this year that we were able to scale it to a whole different level. So to talk a little bit more about it, let's see. Yeah, shoot the arrow. Oh. Okay, so how we describe data scholars is as a community where students from many disciplines and backgrounds learn together and develop their skills in data science. So what do we mean by many disciplines and backgrounds? So a lot of that is that the data scholars program focuses on serving students who have been historically underrepresented in the field, including but not limited to historically underrepresented race or ethnicity and gender, First generation, low income, transfer, re-entry, student parents, undocumented, disabled, foster, and a part of the LGBTQIA community. So a lot of this is how our identities intersect and how we could talk about them in the field of data science, right? Because our diverse presence really does matter in the field. So when I first started working with data scholars, it started just because my professor emailed me and was like, hey, like, or I guess a little bit more background how CR and I met and how we ended up teaching together. Um, what Ciara is currently teaching is a program called BUDS or Berkeley Unboxing Data Science, which teaches data science or the fundamentals of it to underrepresented high school students. So I was the lead for the program last summer and Ciara was one of the, um, was someone on the instructional staff and now she is the one leading the program this summer. So it's really exciting that we're actually reaching out to our underrepresented students and making sure that we're supporting ourselves. So when it comes to the first class of Data Scholars Foundations, I make sure that we actually open up and have honest conversations about our identity. So like myself, I identify as Latino, first generation and low income. My parents weren't able to go to any school beyond the third grade in Mexico. Um, I grew up in a low income household here in the United States. And I also identify as Latino, which is fairly underrepresented here at the UC Berkeley campus. So just opening up and having these conversations really does help students, you know, feel a little bit more at home because definitely, you know, you come to such a large school such as Berkeley, you experience a little bit of culture shock no, ma no matter your background, right? Maybe you're learning how to code for the first time, right? Like that in itself is intimidating because everyone knows Berkeley as like this school that's all about technology and engineering, right? So that in itself is intimidating for students. And we're trying to remove these barriers of entry and making sure students actually feel supported in the environment, which we intend should be nothing but introductory. So that's how we focus on serving data scholars. So to talk a little bit more about the program itself, we have multiple components for the program. So first we start off with the lower division components of data scholars. The first one being foundations, which is the introduction that we want every single student to have. 
Ciara and I taught the Data Scholars Foundations program, which supports students with an additional one unit course alongside Data 8. So not only are they attending Data 8, which is a total four unit course, but they're also concurrently enrolled in the Data Scholars Foundations course, which, which is where we have a Data Scholars Foundation workshop, which I'll talk a little bit more about later um, in the slides. So as we talk about here, Foundations is the first component where we support scholars enrolled in Data 8 by providing a close-knit atmosphere of a small class within the large Data 8 class, right? Although Data 8 is a total of 16, about 1,600 students each semester, right? Like it's a huge class. You'd expect to be able to make friends, but it's quite the contrary. With such a large class, it's more easy to feel left out and out of place or even lonely sometimes just because you see so many people. So that's what we really try to focus on with the Foundations program. So as we describe it, the program augments Data 8 with a weekly workshop, dedicated homework parties and office hours, as well as advising. So we really try to make sure we're fully supporting our students with all the resources they can need to feel empowered from the beginning, use all those tools and resources, and then continue to thrive within data science here at Berkeley. Another thing is the academic development. So, you know, students took Data 8, they had this really great resource of Data Scholars Foundations, what next, right? Like you met all these great people, you worked with these great peers, and then like you're just let go out there into the wild to just like, you know, continue taking classes. Um, so one of the things with this academic development is intended as you take other introductory data science courses, such as like our CS61A course, CS61B, um, maybe even Data 100, which is like their introduction to data science at the upper division. Um, we try to make sure we keep students into these small groups, maybe even the same lab section or something like that. It really does depend on the course and it depends on like how many students are enrolled in those other courses. But we try to make sure students remain as connected as possible because you know, if you like met a whole bunch of students in Data Scholars Foundations, you might still feel a little bit more comfortable with them. Does anyone have any questions about the lower division support so far? Yes, question. Well, I guess one thing that I'm a little bit confused about is the undergrad teaching support. Does that mean like instructor of record? Does that mean um, like what's the status? Great question. So the question is like who exactly is teaching these foundations courses? And then there's another question. How big are those small classes? And the other question is, how big are these small classes? So I will actually be talking about this more. Um, I will be talking more in detail about data scholars foundations, actually. Yeah. Any other quick questions? Yes. What do you identify the students they want to join or really? Yeah, so the question is, how do we identify these students? So there's actually two different ways that we identify students for the Data Scholars Program. The first one is that we just make a general announcement that if you feel that you identify with any of these like identities and you want to be a part of the Data Scholars Program, then you are more welcome to apply. And we typically accept students at a, as like a first come first serve basis. So if you ended up applying, more often than not, you will have a place guaranteed in the program, so long as there still is space available. If like this past semester in spring 20, we were fortunate enough to expand the program to over 100 students, um, we actually had seats remaining. So what we ended up doing is we actually ended up, you know, first day of data eight lecture, make another announcement. Hey, we have some seats left in data scholars. If you feel you identify with this program, please apply, join us. Yeah, does that answer your question? Okay, question. Did you say this is one unit course or this is just a support for all students? Yeah, so the question is, is this just a one unit course or a support for students? So the data scholars program as a whole is like a program. Like once you become a data scholar, you're always a data scholar. The only thing that is a one unit course from this slide specifically is the data scholars workshop, which is what you take concurrently if you're taking data eight at the moment. Yeah, this academic development, it's more intended just to keep you connected with other data scholars. Yeah. Okay. So now moving on to the upper division. So what could you get from the upper division component of the data scholars program? So one thing is the discovery program. So here at Berkeley, we have something called the data science discovery program, which basically connects you to research opportunities, whether that be with professors, um, PhD students, maybe even master students working on their research or even like other external companies. A lot of people want our expertise in data science. So that's what the data, the data science discovery program is aimed at. When it comes to data scholars, we try to make sure that we're actually matching you um, with the program that is right for you or just like some student team that's right for you. We really do our best. And then not only that, but for data scholars, there's also a separate component, I believe, which is also one unit. I'm not too sure as I'm not a part of that aspect of the data scholars program, 
but it's intended for you to work with other data scholars on your research component of the discovery program. And then lastly, we have the career development. So for scholars who are currently enrolled in upper division data science courses and wish to explore opportunities in industry, um, we have a career accelerator program here at Berkeley that tries to match you or tries to support you with finding some career opportunities out there. And you get the extra benefit if you are a data scholar yourself. So there's the four main components, but again, all of these components are still being built in like work in progress. I believe the data scholars program as a whole was built around 2017, but it didn't start to pick up momentum until recently. Um, um, thank, like very thankfully to a lot of investments that have been made into the program. So the student's introduction to data scholars. So talking a little bit more about that, once again, this is through the data, the data scholars foundations workshop. So the program augments data eight foundations of data science through a weekly workshop featuring scholar guides. So when Ciara and I took charge of this foundations, pro foundations course um, starting in fall 21, we created these things that are called scholar guides. What they're intended to do is to do a close reading of the data eight textbook and also provide students with practice questions from previous semester exams to make sure that students are actually working on exam problems throughout the semester so that by the time they get to an exam, they feel empowered because they had actually been studying for the exam the whole entire time. So we try to really even the playing field. Next up is the foundation's homework party. So two or maybe even three days a week, it depends on how large the program is. Um, we have three hours in a classroom where you as a student or as a data scholar are welcome to come into homework party. The whole point of this is so that you could come together with other students to talk about the homework that you're working on. But not only that, we always have staff, data scholars staff present to always walk around, ask if you have any questions, ask if you wanna discuss any of the problems or even maybe walk through a problem if like multiple students are having questions about a problem. Next up, we also have foundations office hours. So like every single week, maybe a TA or maybe even a couple of tutors of the program will open up some Zoom office hours to support students if they have any last minute questions. And then lastly, we give our data scholars direct connection to advising. So we have a direct data scholars advisor who is there to ask, to answer any questions that a data scholar might have, whether that might be about the course itself, the data eight course that they just wanna talk about, if they wanna talk about like, you know, what could you do with data science, right? Because typically you hear about data science, you're like, what is data science? Like, I don't know what that is. Um, that's what the advisor is there for, to really clarify those questions. So the most important and exciting part of this Data Scholars Foundations workshop is that it is entirely run by undergraduate students like myself, Ciara, and other amazing students. I feel like that's probably the most personal part of the program where it feels like you're actually removing a barrier. Because I feel like typically like myself, when I first started here at Berkeley, like I was so shy to ask questions. Like I would look at like the professor and be like, I don't want to ask them a question because they're going to think I'm dumb, right? So that's always the worry. And especially for underrepresented students, more often than not, they always had the experience of like, that's a dumb question or like read the textbook or like we learned this the other day, like always these small macro aggressions that always end up happening that a lot of students are used to. So we really try to remove that by making sure that, you know, the first contact is another undergraduate just like yourself and maybe even someone that you directly identify with. Um, I know for myself, right, like the moment I mentioned that I was a first generation college student, so many students came up to me with the same, like, oh my God, like I haven't met other first generation college students like you. Um, that's why I decided to go into teaching, right? Like I always wanted um, a Latino TA um, that I would see represented by myself, with myself. And then also like, I always wanted to see like, oh, are there any TAs out there who are first generation as well? Like that matters to me. And it really does matter to students to see someone that you identify with. So that's the main goal of this data scholars program. Um, but not only that, not only is it meant to empower you as you take the course, but we're really trying to transform it so that it creates a pipeline so that you take data eight, you're a part of data scholars. Okay, how could we get you into teaching? Like we really want to see you as teachers. So we really emphasize that aspect as well. So I wanna talk a little bit about my experience um, leading the program this entire year. So two pictures, um, here's a picture with my fall semester class. And then to the picture in the right, that's actually me and Ciara. So Ciara is my co-lead for this program. You just met her as we were teaching the Data 8 lab earlier. Um, we really like, like hold this program to our heart. Um, she was a data scholar herself. She went through Data Scholars Foundations before it became what it is today. Uh, so she's really seen the transition. I became a data scholar, but it wasn't until after I took Data 8. So I wasn't able to experience this program from the beginning. Um, but yeah, so... What we essentially ended up doing in this one year is scaling the program from 30 to 100 students in one academic year. Definitely a huge challenge that was just 
placed onto us, but one that we are like very grateful for, right? Like who like just puts all this responsibility on undergrads, but then also that responsibility is what's awesome because like, you know, we're able to build the program as you see fit, like based on our needs, right? Like we know what we wish we had. So we implemented all those changes. Um, another thing, last semester, Ciara and I were developing all of the materials week by week. So not only do we have our own responsibilities as students, but we also had to create all of these color guides that I previously mentioned. Um, but yeah, definitely a lot. The next and most important thing is fostering mentorship and leadership among students and staff. So a lot of what we talk about is like, you know, like, although you see me as like your undergraduate student instructor standing in front of you in the classroom, or maybe even helping you around, like, I want you to see me as a friend, like, to be honest, like, just see me as a friend and just having those conversations and treating students that way, it definitely opens up a lot of conversations and makes students feel a lot more comfortable to ask you questions, right? Typically, like the first week, like students are really shy to ask questions and like, they're like, I feel dumb. Like, I, I always have students, even to this day, like, well, I don't teach anymore, but even like up until the final week that I was teaching here at Berkeley, I'd have students be like, oh, I feel so dumb. Like, I'm sorry for asking this question. I'm like, no, like, don't apologize. Why are you apologizing, right? Like, I want you to ask me questions. Like, that's what I'm here for. I don't want to stand here and just like, you know, just, you know, like, what's the point of me being here if I'm just standing here? Um, so yeah, it's definitely fostering mentorship, making sure that the students acknowledge that you're there for them. And most importantly, addressing the student by name always. So yeah, and that connects over to direct connection with students, just making sure you acknowledge them, realize their teaching or like their learning habits and so on. And that's probably the most important part of data scholars, just like acknowledging all the individual aspects of the student. But yeah, that's my little bit about my experience. I'll talk a little bit more after, but are there any questions? Yeah, so the data scholars materials have just been created, so they're not public yet, but we will work um, to give you some examples to work with. Yeah. Yes, question? Uh, yeah, I have a couple of questions. The first one is like, this is awesome for your perspective, so like, class for you. <laughs> Thank you. Else is <laughs> um, the two questions I have is what faculty support do you need to make this happen? That's one question. And then the second question is what kind of funding do you need to make this happen? Because off the top of my head, I'm thinking, okay, we just have to pay you for running it, but is there any other cost associated with it? Yes, great question. So the first question is what faculty support did we need for this program? So for the first one, um, it really rotates. So the two main people that I have worked with are Professor Dinero, up here, I think, uh, and Professor Adhikari. So how I actually ended up getting hired into this role, um, I ended up teaching the Berkeley Unboxing Data Science program over last summer. Um, I did really well in that role, and Professor Adhikari really saw how much, like, you know, how much of a commitment I had to serving underrepresented students here at Berkeley. So she asked me, she was like, hey, like, you're gonna have a lead position in the data eight course as a 20 hour TA each week. Do you wanna have a lead position leading data scholars? And I was like, absolutely, like, please. And she was like, okay, great. And then she was like, okay, like I'm also hiring Ciara, like you're gonna work together. I was like, amazing. Like I'd love to work with Ciara again. So we were both hired. Um, and Professor Adhikari at the time was like, so this is what I'm thinking. This is what you could do. This is what's worked before. This is what's not worked before. How could you change things? That's pretty much all the support we got, yeah. Professor Adhikari had so much trust in Ciara and I to take this program to whatever extent we needed. And it was Ciara and I who were like, let's create scholar guides. So all we were told is, here's your students, here's your time, here's your classroom. What could we do based on the textbook? Because the Data A textbook is honestly very beautiful. I love it. Like it's really great. Like it's really great to learn data science. Um, so that's the only support that we really got. Like, here's all the stuff that you need. What could you do? And so Ciara and I, we really brainstormed for an entire week and we're like, okay, like we have all this great stuff, what could we do? And so we're like, let's create something like, you know, that's a weekly thing. Like what is some material that students don't have so far in lab, in lecture and in the assignments? So that's why we created something totally new called the Scholar Guide. What it's intended to do is create both a close reading of the textbook, but also additional to that is a whole like, maybe one or two questions every single week from prior exam problems of previous semesters to make sure students are getting some exam exposure early on. This isn't really done anywhere else in the course, so it was perfect for us, right? It fills in all the gaps and gives students the opportunity to read the textbook because we always tell students read the textbook and almost nobody reads it sometimes. 
So yes, that's why we focused on the textbook. And you'd believe the reviews we've had, the amount of people that are like, read the textbook, like, oh my God, it's amazing. Like we ask our students at the end of the semester and they're always like, the textbook is amazing. I'm like, yes, like that's why we tell you to read the textbook and that's why we focus on it here. Um, so yeah, as for the support, yeah, professors are like, here, do your thing. Here's what you have, do your thing. And honestly, I, I love that part because not only do you have the trust, but like you have other underrepresented students creating it, it themselves. So it's definitely very empowering. The second question I believe was about funding and how do you secure the funding? So to be honest, I cannot answer that question myself. Um, the professors themselves, Professor Adhikari, Professor Dino, and I'm very sure other professors have worked very hard to secure the funding for us. Because yes, I would say, you know, last semester there were a total of both CR and I were the two lead undergraduate student instructors. And then we also had a total of five tutors. This semester, we grew the program to 100 students. So we had four um, teaching assistants and eight tutors. So definitely, like it really does depend on the size of the program. I'll talk a little bit more about how we decide on these sizings. But yes, the financial support aspect of it, I can't really answer. I'm really sorry. Yeah. Question? Yeah, just to be clear with the textbook, you talked about the yeah so the question is like what textbook do we use it's the data eight course textbook that's open source for everyone yes any other quick questions questions yes <laughs> yeah so in the data eight course staff um you could become an eight hour te teaching assistant or maybe even a 20 hour um if you're a 20 hour, you have some lead role, whether it's like you're in charge of grading, you're in charge of logistics, you're in charge of pedagogy. Both CR and I have been hired to lead data scholars. What about the tutors? How many hours do you have? Eight. Yes. Another question? So you you refer to yourself as a teaching assistant. Um, I know in our institution, teaching assistants are kind of like a unionized thing for grad students. Um, is that do you have any knowledge or is any working for here? Do you have any knowledge of like how they're, they're represented by the same union? There's undergrad uh, UGSIs that are represented by the same union as the graduate Okay. Yes. Yes. Do you track the outcomes? Oh, yes. I don't have any numbers, but I one anecdote. Um, my most favorite memory was last semester um, prior to the final itself. Professor Adhikari came up to me and was like, your data scholars grade distribution is higher than the data eight course distribution. That was the most impactful thing I had ever heard because I was like, how did we take, you know, I've had students be like, I didn't even learn calculus in my high school. I had students be like, I didn't learn coding at all. This is my first time coding. This is my first time learning statistics. So to hear these like statements, even from the professor, like it definitely has an impact. And then if you look at our reviews, like always so many positive reviews, like this program is so rewarding for us. Yeah. Okay. I'm going to continue for the sake of time, but um, here's some examples, right? So here's some pictures of the course staff for teaching assistants or UGSIs. Um, for this semester, uh, this is a picture of this semester. So Amelia, um, who was a tutor for Data Scholars last semester, so she moved from tutor to teaching assistant, myself and Ciara. Um, Megna, so Megna was a part of another course, I believe like statistics course, she moved with us to Data Scholars. And then Noor, um, she is a data eight teaching assistant, but she helped us out with data scholars. So we included her here. And then here are our eight tutors. So we had Dana, Devin, Kalechi, Lillian, Nikhil, Paul, Ramisha, and Zaid. So can I get a guess? So this was this semester, they were the tutors this semester. How many do you think were students last semester? Okay, I like the optimism, I'm hearing all of them, but the answer is four of them. But still, <laughs> isn't that crazy? Like you just took the class and then you're supporting like other students the next semester as a tutor. Like you're actually getting paid as a tutor the following semester. So that's what we mean about this pipeline. Like we really want to empower students that like, you know, you learn the content, you finally felt some form of like support, representation, whatever it might be. Okay, now we want you to go to teaching to support other students as well. And thankfully it's worked really well this semester. So last semester going into this semester, I believe we had interest of about eight out of the 60 students and this semester we had interest from like 25 out of the 100 students so definitely each semester we noticed that like more and more students are becoming interested in becoming teachers and i even had other students tell me like i never saw myself as a teacher but i love learning how to code i love helping my peers learn how to code so definitely you know providing that environment of support you know making sure that they feel like 
you know, they're able to help other students. So definitely this program is, I'm very sad to be graduating from Berkeley because I just know this program is going to be like flourishing in the coming years to come. And yeah, it's going to continue to be led by Ciara because she still has one year left. And I'm so excited for them. And you got an amazing job. Yes. So, <laughs> <laughs> yes, I got an amazing job. Um, but yeah. But he's going to hopefully teach at a community college in the greater Los Angeles area. Yes. <laughs> yes, we will see. I will be working as a data scientist. And if I have time, I hope to continue to teach. Here is a quote from one of our tutors from this semester, um, Ramisha, third one in the bottom. Here's a quote from before I even found out she became a tutor. She told us in her final end of semester review, y'all were absolute rock stars. Thank you so much for being amazing mentors and teachers. I am blown away at the fact that you are undergraduates and not graduates. Truly, your teaching is so impeccable. There were so many things I went into scholars not knowing anything and came out with such a strong understanding of a concept. Thank you all for believing in us and being such strong advocates. So when I read this end of semester quote, I was like, first of all, who said this? Like, so sweet. But it touched like all of our hearts, right? Like as undergraduates ourselves that we were able to have this impact with the program that we were creating ourselves. That's what's so empowering and why the program is succeeding like every single day. Um, but yeah, I like Ramisha did an absolute amazing job as a tutor this semester. I know from the students who were students last semester became tutors this semester, like in the beginning, they were super shy, super scared, like Carlos, Ciara, like, what are we doing? Like imposter syndrome, like we don't deserve to be helping students, like a lot of that. But over time, by the end of the semester, oh my God, you could see them. They're like, oh, like, do you need help? Like, like they're there to support our students. So definitely you see a lot of growth through teaching itself. So really quickly, I know for the sake of time, we're running out a little bit. I want to talk about how we actually run the foundations workshop and talk a little bit more about how it's structured, because it really is the highlight of the data scholars program, in my opinion. So it's an hour and a half. Um, it is led by one teaching assistant and two tutors per workshop. So basically, it's meant to be about somewhere between 20 to 30 students per workshop and led by three staff members total. We break it up so that you're working in a small group. So you know, the classroom size divided by three, and you're either working with the TA or one of the tutors. However, we know there's a little bit of imbalance with that. So we also make sure to move around and still support students regardless of whatever group that you're in. How we structure it is that, again, we use these color guides to have a close reading of the data eight textbook, giving students an environment to reinforce course content at their own pace, and with the ability to, you know, ask a staff member questions about the material at any time, make connections between textbook and lecture material, and then most importantly, working with peers. Another thing is practice problems from previous data eight midterms and finals. So we want to make sure, you know, in case, you know, you're busy, you don't really have time to study before the exams. Surprise, you've actually been studying the whole time because we've been including exam problems from previous exams. Um, so that, you know, our idea is that it gives students exposure to exam problem, exam level problems early on. And by the time a student reaches the exam, they have already been well prepared. And then lastly, so those first two things, the close reading and the practice problem, we usually give students about the first one hour of the hour and a half of workshop to work on that both in groups or individually if they want some time by themselves. And then lastly, we spend the remaining amount of time where the TA goes to the front of the class and asks, what questions did we have? You know, what were some questions in the textbook? What were some questions in the scholar guide? What were some exam level questions that we were all stuck in? With our idea of this is that, you know, regardless of what group you're in, regardless of like, you know, what part of the scholar guide you were working on, like you have something to fall back on and, you know, still you like, you're not going to leave without learning something, right? So that's our idea of that, making sure we do that small recap, making sure that every single student feels supported in the end. Um, but yeah, that's how we structure the workshop itself um, within the hour and a half. Next is really important as to how we treat our attitude with data scholars. So the one thing that CR and I came into these scholar guys with was with the idea of we don't believe in getting all of the answers correct during workshop. From myself, when I was first learning how to do computer science and data science, like the things that I would remember the most were the things that I got wrong first, right? I feel like often we're so trained, like, come on, like plug and chug, let's get the right answer, right? But then if you keep plugging and chugging, like, are you gonna remember that in the exam? Are you gonna remember that later on once you're a data scientist? probably not right because you're just used to plugging and chugging whereas like you know if you're given the opportunity to explore and make mistakes and then talk about that with the team like someone on course staff you're going to remember it a lot more because you'll be like wow like i remember when i made that mistake and that always happened every single weekend workshop like 
I talk about a concept with a student and they'd be like, oh my God, yeah, I remember you corrected me on that the other day. And I'm like, yeah, like, okay, I'm glad you're making these connections. Like, I love when they make the connections. So that's our attitude. Just, you know, give students a chance to explore. It's okay to make mistakes. The second thing is that students are encouraged to ask their peers questions first. So before they even try to ask a TA, like, you know, we're always available. We're always asking, do you need, do you have questions? Do you want to talk about anything? But we always try to encourage them to ask each other questions first, because that way, you know, they probably have the same question. They probably have the same confusions. And then we'll actually be able to better support our students and better identify what they're struggling with. So that's why we prioritize that. But again, staff members are attentive to students. We always make sure that they're always asking if the students have any questions. And then lastly, we want to treat scholars as a space of empowerment. So we always encourage our students to apply to course staff afterwards. And we really want them to become teachers themselves. Um, but really quickly, I have two pictures. So this is what our scholar guide looks like. So when students first open the Google document, um, a link to the close reading, a link to practice questions, which just links them to the bottom of the document. Um, some very preliminary questions, right? So like we're learning about a normal curve. What are some features of a standard normal curve? Like what are the mean and standard deviation, right? So very simple. We want to make sure that students are actually understanding these concepts to the detail because it goes over their heads during lecture. And then here's an example of the practice questions, which basically like we always say where it's adapted from. So is it adapted from fall 2017 final? Where does it come from? So that they could always look into it when they're studying for the exams. But yeah, that is the end. I know we're running out of time. I'm so sorry. Awesome. Yeah. <laughs> Another question while I change it up? Yes, question. Uh, so this, yeah, so this takes place um, either Mondays or Tuesdays, 5 to 6.30. So we've had our same exact times, like, ever since we started working with this format. Yeah, great question. Question? Yeah. Do you have a set of participate in any way other than, obviously, for getting community and a sense of belonging and extra academic support? Is there anything else? Yeah, so the question is, do we incentivize students to any extent of participation? So thankfully, like our students always want to participate. So we've never struggled with like incentivizing them. Like, you know, students are asking for the support. So when they finally get it, they're going to take advantage of it. So we've actually never struggled with that. Yeah. Question. I'm not sure that the, uh, the people that apply to be um, undergraduate instructors are in yeah, so the question is like, how do we actually ensure that the students interested in teaching actually like are interested in teaching, right? Or like going into teaching, teaching assistant? Yeah. Or maybe even as a profession. Yeah, so we always, again, like I feel like students come up to us, like how do I become you? <laughs> like I've had that question so many times, like how are you where you're at? And then from there, um, we always tell them early on about like, so these are the teaching opportunities here at Berkeley. But even at the end of the semester, we're like, hey, Here's the application. If you are interested in teaching, please apply. Let us know if you have any questions. It's a peer-driven organization too. Like you men, you get tutored, you get mentored while you're tutored, you get trained. So by the time you got into Carlos's level, you may have you, you may have had a few experiences. You'll know. But there's a cultural thing. People really like to belong to it. You know, it's just like a way to belong in the big university and feel like you're really contributing. It gives people a lot of meaning to their careers. Um it's okay. I'm gonna go yeah. to the next thing. Right. Um, thank you, everyone. Thanks, Carlo. So inspiring. So inspiring. And I know Ciara wishes she could have been in both places at the same time as well. Or they just do. All right. Um, so I want to talk about a whole stack and a whole set of uh, technology that's behind data. Inc. Um, and one of the things I, I've given this talk a lot of times to a lot of different kinds of audiences. And one of the things I thought about when I was framing the talk this time is uh, sometimes when they talk about, de we talk about DevOps and, and delivering this big amount of infrastructure. This new term, I, I'm going to take my mask off while I'm talking, if it's okay. Um, 
This new term is like infrastructure as code. What does it mean to deploy something that's infrastructural, but as code? And there's this term like as code, what does that mean? So I'm gonna say in this whole talk, there's elements of software engineering best practices that sort of infect the whole way that the data eight course materials are taught. And the whole way that a whole set of open source technologies uh, sort of fits together and makes this something scalable. It's also a little bit while we're why I'm here, right? So that Data8 was made as a giant open source project that, that sort of like fits together in multiple ways. And that's why it's scalable. That's why it was built to scale at UC Berkeley so we could teach 1,500 people. That's got like key elements of there just so you can survive teaching a 1,500 person class. But key elements of that also make it so that we can be like, hey, what would it be like for any community college in California that wanted to come and teach the same way? What if people around the world could teach the same way and use the little bits of it that are useful to them and adapt other bits out? So I'm going to try and make that like, what is the software engineering practices that are making this thing work as a project? So one of the things that I do in my job is sort of like explain this and make it available to everybody. And this is iterative over every year. You all got a hand, you all got a handout in your blue folder that has like, a, you know, the names and the links and a short guide to what are all these things and how do they all fit together, right? So data aid has like all these different elements that fit together. If you want to go to the web page, there's a second one, data.berkeley.edu slash external. So you can go there and you can find a very similar set of things that you can go and follow the hyperlinks. And there's more stuff that's like, you know, guides to how to set up data, guides to how to set up the Jupyter Hub, uh, guides to data 100. So this is constantly being renewed. Obviously, you know, the web page will be renewed with greater frequency than a piece of paper. Um, but there are sort of like, you know, sets of materials that we're putting out there. So specifically for people coming to this workshop is going and sort of following along the different elements that Data8 is, right? So one of the main places to start is data8.org where you can then pick a different semester. Uh, so John already showed this where it will have the calendar, which is basically like the syllabus, uh, slides, demos, and videos. Not all of these are available to people outside of Berkeley. So some of like the videos you'll click on and be like Berkeley only, right? Um, if you go to some of the older years, things are still on YouTube in the older years. So if you're, you're, if you're hard pressed, go and look at like 2017 or 2018. Um, uh, then uh, the worksheets as well and the, um, and the, uh, and the labs. Uh, so these are the Jupyter Notebooks and these are the documents that like Carlos and, um, and Ciara were showing a little bit. Uh, Long story short, if you want those and as an instructor, email us or go and fill out the form and we make a set of materials available as instructors. So you can sort of see where they fit in on the class if you go through this web page. And if you find stuff that's blocked, it's probably in this instructor-based uh, repository that we can add you to if you sign the, uh, a confidentiality agreement. Everything's in GitHub. We'll get back to this and we'll show this a little bit. But um, everything that you see here, almost all is being sourced from GitHub. So behind the scenes, all these elements of the class are being, are being sort of like set up on GitHub. And you, it takes a while, but once, when, you know, once you can sort of navigate around, you can start to find all the different elements of the class on the, on the GitHub for Data8. Um, so uh, this is a quick one that, it isn't quite updated yet, but um, can I move this out of the way? Uh, there's a website that we made for last year's workshop um, with, with a public repo of a whole bunch of stuff that's available. And I wanted to point this out because people have already brought this up, uh, where can you run Data8 on CoLab? So there's a whole set of links of what's it like to run Data8 on CoLab. Importantly, you go to the first link and it says, how do I set up? CoLab to mount my Google Drive. So if I have my own Google Drive where I can put my materials in, I'm going to mount my Google Drive so that CoLab can see my Google, my Google Drive. Uh, we can get more into this if people are interested, but there's Binder, uh, there's, a, there's a Demo Hub at 2i2c, there's DeepNote. So we're constantly working on what is it like to deliver uh, data aid materials on all these different platforms. And so this is just an example that you can check out. So you know, think of it cognitively, data aids like a whole bunch of Jupyter notebooks 
you can get those Jupyter notebooks. You can just render them as HTML. You just open them so you don't compute them. But if you hit this, it'll open instantaneously, which is kind of nice. Uh, you could, and then you can open them like three or four different kinds of ways to see. And you, as an instructor, if you're going to be starting out new, you're going to be trying to think of like, what are these choices that I'm going to make? Like, how do I want to deliver my class? Um, and there's more, if you come, there's a tech panel on Thursday, there's like three or four other people that are coming with different ways to deliver as well. Um, Kent Foster and Corey Hawkins from Microsoft are here. So Microsoft keeps having different ways. Um, so we, we work closely with them. Uh, one, um, one right now that's close is uh, GitHub Code Spaces. So there'll be one of the, uh, that somebody from GitHub will come on Friday. We met the people from Harvard at uh, the SIGC conference in uh, Providence, and they're deploying their Harvard class materials using GitHub code spaces. So we're like, all right, let's figure it out. What's it gonna take to deploy there as well? Um, so it's kind of fun, sort of ongoing, ongoing uh, area that we're still innovating. Um, so I just wanna quickly take you to some through some terms. Some of you may already know all this stuff, but for people who are new, or you know, not coming from a computer science background to sort of like break down what the elements are. So, so because it can be confusing at the, at the first instance. First instance is what is a Jupyter Notebook? So first Jupyter Notebook is just a file format, IPYNB, formerly called an IPython Notebook. But think of it as a file format, a file type, right? It's a basically got a JSON structure. Uh, within that file type, you can have explanatory text and markdown, you can have chunks and code, and it's up to like 50 different kinds of code now. We're going to mainly be talking about Python, but we do have people at Berkeley that teach in Jupyter R, because it's really easy. Um, and then when you execute that little mix of code, you'll see the visualization in the same place as well. So you're seeing the explanation, little bits of code, and the visualization all together. Um, it seems very interactive. It's very intuitive to the learners of today. Everything is in a browser tab. In the browser tab, I see everything I want. I don't have to window back and forth. I don't have to worry about paths. I'm just staying and doing my whole homework in this browser tab. It, the student, you know, it's, it's hard to be like, you know, I'm from like before any of this existed, before the internet existed. So I'm like, oh, this is an innovation. But like, you know, if you're 19 or 17, like this is just like, seems like a really logical way that, that the world would be organized. Um, we can go to the textbook. So there's also, you know, I feel like we're, we're, there's this thing with the textbook where we're breaking down the wall, right? So we also have the data eight textbook we've talked about inferentialthinking.com. But when the textbook looks just like the Jupyter notebook and it's built from the same source material, right? You're like, and you can update them both in real time. Like, you know, what, it, instead of like a textbook being like this printed thing I bought at the store, it's fixed in stone. It's been fixed for five years. This is like, you know, everything is becoming sort of sourced from the same elements. Um, and as Carlos said, that's what they're doing. They're like getting the students to read the textbook really well. So when they're doing the homework, it'll feel familiar. Um, back to Jupyter Notebooks. One way to think about what we're sharing here from Data8 is we're sharing a set of Jupyter Notebooks. So maybe the Data8 class between homeworks, labs, projects, maybe there's like 30 Jupyter Notebooks. There's probably a lot more, but like there's some core set of Jupyter Notebooks. And in the end, what is teaching the class and what is, you know, like as Sharon said, there's no final anymore, right? It's like you complete those 30 notebooks and you answer everything in those notebooks and you've done the learning. So now the learning is the completion of the notebooks. That's like a, just a cognitive way to think about, you know, what is the course? You think about, it's a file, it's a certain file type. You know, what we're going to talk about today is students get their individual copy of that file type. They do some work in it, they type some things in, they run some things, they try again, they redo it, and then they save that file at the end and submit it. So that's what we can talk about today. It's like, this is a file and that's your work. There's also something called Jupyter Notebook. This was a little bit confusing to a bunch of people where there's Jupyter Notebook, the file, and there's Jupyter Notebook, the web app. There's something that is driving this in the browser, right? And this can be a little confusing to people as well. So it's a free open source project. Uh, you can go and install this from Anaconda. And you can say, I have my laptop. I want to install some free software. I'm going to install Jupyter Notebook. And it's going to be something that interprets that file in a browser. I know this is super confusing, but like there's something that's like the interpreter that's interpreting the file and that's finding the Python kernel to execute the code. 
So let's just think of like, there's something that's just the Jupyter Notebooks that they're files, and there's something that's like interpreting it on your computer. Um, so it can open it and display it, and it can execute the code when it needs, and it can save it as like a new format at the end. Less and less, we're just using Jupyter Notebook. Now the web app is maturing and it's like on like, you know, another iteration. So it's now called Jupyter Lab. Uh, we can talk and uh, dif differentiate that as well, but that's sort of like an IDE, like a programming environment that's gonna show up in a browser tab um, as well and interpret these notebooks. Hope I'm not losing people. The other big thing that we're gonna talk about is called the Jupyter Hub. So, what we're doing at UC Berkeley is building a giant Jupyter Hub, which is a server that provides that web app to all of the students. And the students just go and log in and they, they log in to the cloud. They don't really know where they're logging in, but the cloud is providing that web app service to all of them. So there's 1,500 students in Data8. None of them go to Anaconda and install the web app on their laptop. They just go... And I'm going to show you how, but they're going to go and, and, and log in through the cloud. And the cloud's going to provide that web app running that notebook on a file server invisibly to them in a browser tab, right? So we, and, and, and apologies, the, the service lead here is that we are providing Jupyter Hub service to everyone at UC Berkeley. It was something that was built for Data8, you know, like the Data8 stories, like with, uh, the story of exponential growth, where there's like 100 people, and there's 500 people, and there's 1,000 people. And yeah, there's metrics we can show at the end, but Brology is now supporting 5,000 users a week. Five, so a lot of people. So um, this is a whole like, interesting story that I'm really passionate about. What does it do to university education when you provide ubiquitous compute in this way to everybody? And can you transform everybody's class? And this is my personal passion is like, okay, we got the data science people covered. Now let's go over to social science, see if we can transform all them too. And biology, you're coming next. Um, that's another talk for tomorrow. All the students know is they went to that link on data eight, they clicked lab two, they don't know how, boom, their lab two showed up in a browser tab. The compute's taken for them, the install's taken for them. They're just trying to do like dot where, dot group, a whole bunch of cognitive stuff like, Where's the file and how did you install it? Like, we're gonna not make them deal with that. Now that they love data science, they're gonna move on and they're gonna be, you know, someday they're gonna install our studio. Someday they're gonna install Anaconda. Someday they're gonna get the TensorFlow working. You know, they're gonna have to fiddle with something someday. The first user, the beginning user, the first time they touch it, I wanna make it really easy and I wanna make them feel like they're winning really soon so that they're gonna like it and not be frustrated. Okay, so this is another one that confuses people. There's Jupyter Hub and then there's GitHub, right? So GitHub is, well, for, for, for one, Git is a protocol that was made by the computer scientists for sort of syncing folders across things. You know, Git has a command line set of terminal commands like fork and push and pull and clone, and they're ways of sort of syncing files. So this is like software engineers are like, how can I do a really good job syncing and, and who's got who's checked out a branch and who's merging a branch back in? So people are collaborating on files. GitHub was like a cloud-based server that worked really well, that was like built from the internals to work with this Git command. But let's just say GitHub is a private company, you know, now part of Microsoft. Um, but it's like a cloud hosting service, but this is all built to work really well with this Git command line stuff. Um, there's a whole bunch of things about GitHub and I can't get into all of them, but there are really amazing parts of things that are built for software engineering, but now we're applying them to curriculum, right? One thing that's amazing, if you're interested in it, right, is like the data eight class was started in like 2017 or something. Every notebook that's ever been served for any data eight class ever is there and you can go find it right now, right? That's kind of cool, right? So it's also, everything's out in the open. Everything's documented, everything's there. Like I challenge you to find me a class in America where every note, every assignment and every homework ever handed out, you could find it right now. Um, so I think it's a little bit revolutionary as a teacher. Like I have a hard time tracking down people's syllabuses. 
right? I think a syllabus should be a public record. And people are like, no, I don't want to share my syllabus, my reading list. I can't share that. Anyways, that's an aside. But um, anyways, uh, what's amazing in data eight to go back is the web page is on GitHub. The textbook is on GitHub. The Python package is on GitHub. Like all of these elements are in there and documented and like how they've changed over time and what the updates are, are all there. So it's, it's really an amazing, uh, you know, documentation of a whole project. So what do I need to know as a teacher? Okay, so I'm an instructor and I need to know these elements and, and what do I need to do to operationalize this for my class? Because I can't do all of this, but I just need to have like a mental map of how this is gonna work. Right, so first of all, I'm gonna start with Python or R and we can talk about whether Python or R is better for, uh, you know, for teaching students. There's a lot of things that are better about R. I, I would say that the choice at Berkeley towards Python, you know, is kind of related to um, 61A being this giant course that everyone was taking. And, and, and a lot of the elements of building data eight were coming from 61A. Um, I, you know, I would also say there's a quote from Hadley Wickham that's like, if you just want to do data science, maybe like they're equal or R is winning. But if you want to learn elements of computer, computer programming, there's some reasons to do Python, like, like some of the logic of computer programming. So I need to know, I need to make some choices about that. And we've talked about, do I use the data science package? There's this other package called AutoGrader that we'll get to. So there's, so, so, so there's some choices about, you know, which, which, which language and which packages to use. And then we're using Jupyter. So I've talked about that. I'm going to deliver it to my students on Jupyter Hub. I'm going to put my course materials on GitHub as a way to deliver it to them. And finally, there's a special sauce that's gonna bring it all together very conveniently for the students and for the instructor, I would argue. And it's called NB Git Puller. And this is a way that I'm gonna make a hyperlink that's gonna distribute all this, all a copy to every student instantaneously with really good, you know, it's not gonna overwrite their files. Um, and so if I do this right, I can write this link that by distributing this link, um, uh, the students will get their homework. So I'm gonna go into these a little bit. So anyways, we're in Python. I don't think we need to belabor the point, but we've, we've chosen Python. We can teach computation and statistics at the same time and go between the two worlds. If you're interested in data eight, like just watch the way the notebooks will teach you a little bit of computer science and a little bit of statistics and a little inference. It's, it's layered in a very elegant way. Jupyter Notebook, as we talked about, sorry, just to go back to, this is the classic notebook that is gonna get deprecated in the future. We'll be in Retro Lab, which is a fork of Jupyter Lab. I can get more into that later. Uh, it basically is gonna look kind of the same. We're just moving to Retro Lab. The reason to move to Retro Lab is because of accessibility. So the future of Jupyter Notebooks and the better JavaScript and all the improvements in, in uh, like visual stuff will happen in RetroLab. So it's our responsibility to like, you know, change it. This is the way we've been using it for four or five years. And this is the, the more recent way. They shouldn't look very much different. So why is Jupyter so powerful for education? Um, if you can come tomorrow, Fernando Perez is here. Fernando Perez is a professor of statistics here, and he's one of the founders of Jupyter Notebooks. And he is the, one of the just the most fascinating, exciting people. If a half hour of his time will just be like amazing. He is like flying forward with the whole thing. And he's like out at like the next iteration and the next iteration. And Bology will show you a whole bunch of stuff tomorrow that's like, what's the latest? What's the latest thing that's happening in Jupyter? Not at the data eight level, but like, what are the more advanced applications that he's you know, pressing the envelope in stat 159. What I'm gonna say that I believe is that Jupiter was made for open science and open reproducible science. The people making Jupiter were scientists that wanted their code to run in different labs. You got the data from the satellite, you're looking for the black hole. My, my lab's finding this. If that's stuck on my supercomputer and it can't run on your supercomputer, that's not science, right? The point that you could share that and be like, hey, could you run the code? See if you see the black hole. That's like reproducible compute was a really powerful innovation, right? But there's a whole bunch of advantages that that has for education. So what if I send you a link at the beginning and you all have exactly the same compute, exactly the same file instantly, 
Like that's a real big advantage for you as a teacher. And you're taking this element that was, um, you know, made for reproducible science, but it's really powerful for education. Another one that I'm passionate about is we're not really telling students that. We're not telling the data aid students, hello, welcome, I'm teaching you reproducible science. But we're kind of teaching them these practices while we're doing it, right? We're teaching them to work in Jupiter. We're teaching them to import packages. Uh, you know, they're, as they go through their data science course pathway, are going to learn more and more of this reproducible open science elements. You know, all the people that work on core staff, they're learning GitHub as they deploy data aid. That's going to make them useful, uh, you know, as working in somebody's lab and there's a whole bunch of practices about like managing data that, you know, GitHub is really powerful for. So I, you know, I'm interested in like, can we make better people as they like go on to grad school or they go on to be scientists because they've learned these practices, you know, starting from data aid early on, right when they got here. Uh, this, is a, this is a paper I always show. It's super old now, but this is how I told my mom what I did because she reads The Atlantic. Uh, this is the idea that uh, computational notebooks were around, like MATLAB and Mathematica invented, you know, Mathematica invented them and MATLAB had them, but they didn't break science until Jupiter came. And it's something about the open source, freely exchangeable, everything about it can pull in open source components that's really making a change. So that's like an exciting pitch for, you know, the long form journalism pitch for why I'm passionate about notebooks. So what are these elements of, of reproducible science, right? And, and these are were made for science, but now we're doing them for pedagogy. One is literate computing. So we're not in a Python script that's just a bunch of things. It's not commented code. It's the code that's very well documented. And Data8 has taken this to an extreme, right? We're like, the textbook and the homework are, are together, right? Like all of the steps are described and why you're doing it in the context. So literate computing, the code is in a document that explains itself. There's a bunch of stuff about version control, who did what, when, and it's timestamped. So uh, everything in GitHub is taking care of that. Every time somebody touches the code, it gets documented. Automation, so you can write scripts that do different of the elements. Uh, if you understood how we write the, how we run the infrastructure in the Jupyter Hub, it's amazing. All these steps are sort of like automated. You can see, and somebody's making a script that runs them all. Data Aid has a whole bunch of this. Like when they make the assignments, there's like a script that makes and develops and deploys the assignments. Um, uh, sort of documenting data. But this is not much about data aid, as I, uh, that's something else, but uh, you know, that you would learn in a, in a later course. Um, but you, you know, we can talk about that. But then finally, con consistent computation that's reproducible, like Docker, right? So that everybody can have the same computational environment. This is definitely what we're doing here with the Jupyter Hub is making every student, doesn't matter if you have a $2,000 MacBook or a $200 Chromebook, you have the exact same computational environment. Everything's running exactly the same. We're leveling the playing field with computation. Um, so they were doing that for reproducible science so everybody gets the same results. But for education and equity and access, it's also really awesome. Oh, wait. Oh, wait. What do I think about protecting intellectual property? Yeah. Uh, so I'm going to just be argumentative in this particular case and be like, what if computer science education was open source and free for everybody to copy and steal all the time, right? Like some people really believe that's the way to go. And some people believe that's the way to maximize the impact. Um, I will tell you one thing that's particular in this case is that the data aid textbook is not an open source textbook. You are not making changes to the data aid textbook or remixing it right? It's freely distributed to everybody. You can go see everything it's made it for. You can go see everything it's done. But the authors of the data aid textbook, particularly Professor Adhikari is not here, want some control of what it is and wants it to stay as like an intact whole, right? So that's her choice as an author of like, how far does making something freely available go? She doesn't want it remixed. She wants it like distributed whole. So th that's interesting. So 
intellectual property has a lot of different boundaries and places. I would say, you know, making something freely available and, uh, you know, my visceral experience by having this conference five years in a row is like, make something freely available makes it powerful and impactful, right? We're not having this conference about somebody's textbook that you have to pay $100 for, right? So I, I'd be like, that's evidence of impact, you know, and how, how many people are taking it on. And people are like, wow, you're, this is all for free. You're sharing this all on GitHub. This is amazing. You know, like this, why people come in the door. Um, so I strongly believe in that sort of that role in education. Um, uh, you know, I don't know. Well, I'm going to keep going. Uh, Jupiter Hub. So UC Berkeley serving this giant uh, amount of data, uh, a giant amount of compute. I guess the point here is make a small amount of compute really available to everyone. If you have a big job, if you have to do something in machine learning, you're going to have to go somewhere else. Uh, but a small amount of compute that's enough to do, like a homework assignment, um, for everyone, uh, for free. Uh, and, and just like, you know, work on the engineering to lower the cost rather than work on charging people or recovering the cost. Um, you know, I make a gateway so that people in an upper division class can open their Azure account and figure out what they need to do or get their credits to do their honors thesis or, you know, whatever it is. But um, let people in. Uh, what's the other uh, well, guardrails, not gates. So it's not gated. Any class can join this. Any class can jump on. If they end up using a lot of compute, we'll have a conversation. But right now, the point is like, come and use it and try. Um, I think I talked about GitHub mostly. Um, you know, I encourage you to go to the GitHub for data and just see how many repos there are and, and how much of this is visible. Um, there's this one, uh, you know, this is the current semester materials spring 22 or current semester. You can see materials um, summer 20 and you'll see the, you know, the class that's being taught right now. Uh, you'll you'll see like the the labs getting deployed and stuff. So, anyways, you know this is just to be like a lab one, right? So another thing to think about the reason we're using GitHub as well is that it's not just the lab one IPYMB notebook, but that notebook's going to refer to some images. It's got little images in there of what you're doing or how to submit to Gradescope or whatever. Um, it's got the test files, and we'll talk about that. You need a little folder with the Python scripts that are going to give the people the real-time feedback. And both Carlos and John have been like, students like having notebooks that give them real-time feedback. So because of that, you need this little test folder. So that's another reason we're using GitHub and NBGit pullers. We need to pull a folder over it at the same time with tests. Um, and the data sets. So usually in everything data science, you need to pull at least one or two or three data sets along with the notebook. So using GitHub and NBGit pullers is a way to pull all of those files together and everything's in the same place. And that's an important, you know, if you're otherwise, if you're a teacher and everybody's done a local install, and you're like, here's the homework and here's the data set and make sure that the path that pulls in the data sets the right place and make sure when you save the homework, it's in the right place where you can find it and submit it. So like a lot of that's been sort of like abstracted away for the new user. And we get polar links. Uh, I guess the innovation this year is that there is now a Chrome extension uh, that UV Panda has written. UV Panda will be here tomorrow. So uh, come to the session on technology tomorrow if you want to see what's up. Chris Piles from Otter will be here. UV Panda will be here. Biology will tell you a whole bunch of new things. So. Um, you know, I'm trying to cover the basics, but like, you know, what's happening and, and some awesome people will be here to talk about what they're working on. UV built a Chrome extension. So if you go to the GitHub page that you want to source your class from, or you want to try it out, you go to a data hub, you go to data eight page. And once you have this Chrome extension installed, uh, you can just make the NVGit puller link right there in the browser. So what this is, is, you know, basically the students have a link when they click that link, it'll pull anything from that repo over to their student files. Um, so let's think about we're a teacher. You know, I'm an instructor. I have to do like, hey, we're in lab one. I'm going to make this link. I'm going to put this link in my LMS. The data eight, for whatever reason, they don't like LMS. They like serving from a web page. The whole class run from a web page. You're probably using Canvas or Blackboard. Canvas, Blackboard, one of those, right? Um, if you're interested, there is a Canvas file for data eight that you can get, which is kind of cool. Um, you know, because it's a it, Canvas itself is a database. So you just get the database file and it like pre-populates. 
Um, but anyways, you're in Canvas and you say, hey guys, it's assignment one. Here's the NBGit puller link. You send that to the students or Canvas sends them when it's the time. Those students click that link. Invisibly to the students, GitHub serves them a file, a, a set of all the files that they need into their own file server on the Jupyter Hub. They're just gonna show up in their browser tab, work through lab one. They're gonna save the file and you as an instructor wanna think about, do you want them to send you the Jupyter notebook or the PDF? Right, so that's like a sort of a choice because um, Canvas for grading wants to do the PDFs. If you're doing auto grading, uh, you can do a zip file with IPYMB. We use Gradescope at UC Berkeley and that's a, like a longer story, but that's how the auto grading happens The students are submitting to Gradescope. Um, but anyway, students need to submit something at the end back into you. Um, so, you know, you want to teach data eight, you can go to GitHub, you can find the public repo that you want. You can clone that, uh, or you could just create new notebooks and fill up a GitHub repo yourself. Um, you're gonna go on and, you know, if you don't have a GitHub account, you're gonna make the repo, you're gonna upload the notebooks and data or just clone them directly. Uh, then you're gonna generate a link that will be specify where your class's GitHub is and what JupyterHub you want to open it at. Like if you want it to open on CoLab or DeepNote, that would also, you could also make links for those. Azure, you know, like what, what, is, the, what is the technology? What's the platform you're choosing? Where is it you're gonna pull it from? And then you're gonna distribute those to your class. So a couple other things to think about in sources for everybody. We are constantly building documentation. UV, I mean, uh, Vology right now is maintaining um, the curriculum guide. So everything we do, like, oh, R or R Studios changed or, you know, a whole bunch of stuff. Like there's so much documentation here um, that's just from classes at Berkeley, but it'll say, it'll be a, like a Berkeley specific adaptation, but there's gonna be something that's interesting to you if you wanna teach in this space. So, and just cognitively here, back to like curriculum as code. What if we wrote a free textbook for educators that was written in Jupyter Notebooks, that was hosted on GitHub, right? That's the whole package is happening, right? Like this, this, this curriculum guide itself is written in the Jupyter Notebooks and it's hosted on GitHub. You, did, you know, you're gonna go and browse it as a web page, but like behind the scenes, the same thing is happening even for the documentation. Okay, so you're sitting out there in the audience, you're like, okay, UC Berkeley's got all this stuff, but what am I gonna do, right? I'm not a UC Berkeley, I don't have a Jupyter Hub. How am I gonna do this, right? So it's been several years. There's tons of documentation. Uh, UV, our guru who does everything for UC, UC Berkeley, uh, building this server has scrupulously, like you wouldn't even believe it till you saw it, documented everything that he's ever done and made guides every year he comes to the workshop and he makes like another guide for how you can do it. So if you're willing to take it on, and, and I think Brian mentioned like, you know, he took some of this on and tried to figure it out when he started, uh, you know, Taylor at uh, North Carolina, like he took this on, you know, so like some people that are like ready to go, like they'll take it on zero to Jupiter hub guide. We also work for a non with a nonprofit to I2C that's directly d building UC Berkeley level Jupiter hubs for other universities. If you're at a California community college, talk to us and we have a free pilot for California community colleges. I don't know if anybody's here from that, but we have a few colleges on there now. Another thing you do is just have students install the software. You know, just go like install Anaconda, install our studio, like all this stuff is free and installable as well. You know, it would be a different way of how you distributed everything, but you could think that through. We have a panel on Thursday that's like this year's up to date. Um, we have Microsoft, uh, we have VS Code, we have DeepNote. Ed is coming. So Ed is like also a discussion platform, but they're serving Jupyter Notebooks. We, I went to the 6 conference, as I said, in March, and there was like so many different people figuring out how to serve Jupyter Notebooks in this space. Um, uh, Google Colab, I think we've already talked about. So there's lots of different ways. There's lots of different possibilities for um, how, but come Thursday and you can hear the people talk about like their approaches. And then on Friday, there's some demos. So if you want to come, those will mostly be online, but you can actually hopefully, you know, click through and, 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 and try out some of these platforms. I don't have anybody from CoLab this year, but we do have Microsoft and Deep Note and, and I should wrap up because Kevin is here and um, Ellen 
And, uh, but, you know, some of this as, a, as an educator, we need to make choices, right? And I'm pretty passionate about notebooks. You'll hear me talk about this again tomorrow. Uh, one thing we need to choose and think about is like, how much do we make the notebook a scaffolded experience, right? So data eight, it's tightly thought out. Like what you have to do and how you step through it is very much thought out. For example, at UC Berkeley, STAT 20, different instructor, totally different approach. He says you start with a blank notebook. He'll give you a PDF maybe that has some commands in it, but you have to write the whole notebook from scratch. So, you know, I think we've already touched on this open, so, you know, a sort of like open unguided project versus strictly guided project. A lot of what's data aid is like, you know, it's, it's scaffolded, it's step by step, everything's like iterative, it's layered. Another thing is if you want to do auto grading, you got to be on this continuum. If you want to be over there, you're not going to do auto grade. You know, and I think that the data eight class with the 1500 people, it's like, it's got to be over here. There's got to be closed form questions. But let's just think about this. Like as teachers, it could be either way, or you could start out with structured notebooks and later in the semester have students make their own notebooks. Uh, there's interactive widgets. Um, there's course specific Python packages. I think we've kind of touched on this. Data eight has its own package. DSC 10 in San Diego has its own package but you as instructors can pull those in. It's like pip install package, import package. So just like everything else in, in Python, you can import a package. There's specific packages people are writing for, for education. Uh, Prob 140 is the upper division probability class, which is actually called data 140 now. Um, they have a, a Python package as well. So this is also like a vision of like, you're learning data science, you're, you're gonna grow over time, you're gonna start with you know, a simple package, but then you can get to more and more complicated packages over time and get to the machine learning packages, um, get to the, you know, mapping, uh, you know, matplotlib and numpy are sort of embedded in the way data eight's doing stuff. Scikit learns like, you know, want, what you want to get to it in, in a later class. So finally, I want to wrap up with AutoGrader. Uh, Chris Piles will be here hopefully tomorrow. He might be online. He's also, I think, going to be at the reception tonight. So uh, amazing uh, person who sort of redid uh, how to grade in notebooks. It's a Python package. So you're like pip install Otter grader, import Otter grader, right? And it can work with Python and R. It can give students that real-time feedback. Um, there's a whole bunch of tools for the instructor. So you can make sort of like instructor side notebook and then if you do a command line, it'll make the student side notebook and the answer key and the problem tests. So it's really made with this sort of like teaching workflow in mind. Uh, Chris will be telling us about Otter version four, which is uh, you know, in tomorrow's session, which is about to be released. What do we need to think about Otter in data eight? So Otter is throughout all the data eight notebooks. Um, definitely part of scaling. It's definitely part of teaching a giant class. Uh, you know, as we've talked about, students get the real-time feedback. They can tell if they've finished part A before they go to part B, right? And that's the first best thing from computer science education. Um, you can have, we, we also talked about there's public tests and private tests, or what's called hidden tests, and you can use that for grading. So in data eight, like in the labs, you have some public, uh, not the labs, in the homeworks or the projects, you have some uh, publicly viewable things that tell you you're doing the right thing, but then you submit it and there's other checks that are private that the students can't see uh, that you can base your grading on. As I said, in data eight, what you got to think of the way it's currently structured is there's a tests folder that has little Python scripts that'll be like question one, Python tests if, if it's right. And so autograders got to build those for you and they're going to be the right place. But as an instructor, you ought to think about like as you distribute the assignments, going to make sure that the test file each time it's something that can catch you up if you're a first time teaching, taking a data aid notebook. If you just take the IPYMV by itself and for some reason you didn't bring the test folder, right at the top, it's gonna to be like import otter, you know, run test one. And it'll be like, oh, where's the test file? It's a common error that you would see the first time that you're doing a data aid thing. It's just fine to ignore it. Like you don't have to use otter grader or you could just delete those lines out. Um, but it's just something that will catch you up quickly and you'll be like, oh, I don't, I'm not sure what's going on. 
Another thing that we got to think about as educators, as I said, if you're using autograded, there has to be a single answer. There's a whole art to this and how you do this. But like, if you're, you know, you have to think about asking questions that have specific closed form. It could be the size of the matrix. It could be like the number of digits in the answer, but there's gonna be something about it that's testable. So um, that's a cognitive thing. But there's a whole flow to learn once you're creating new things or new projects where you like create the project and you, you hash out what you want to be, you know, what the students to be answering. I got to wrap up, hand over to these guys. Uh, we do have, this is obscure, we also have a podcast, Data Science Education, the podcast. It's really great. Brian Wright was on the podcast. Yeah, work. Suraj is on the podcast. Anybody else in the room on the podcast? <laughs> Julia is not, she, she, Julia's got recorded, but it didn't get released yet. Um, so we're between season two and season three. But if you're, you know, you've got something for the podcast, email us and we're always looking to interview more folks. Um, Bology also has a newsletter that's about the Berkeley Data Hub. And this is like, if you want to have like, what's the latest and what's like the next feature, this is like, we're cutting out, you know, we're trying out the next feature and the next feature and the next feature. Um, and it has interviews with instructors, like what I liked was this or what I didn't like was this. So uh, if you're interested, it's a good source. Okay, I'm gonna save our users data and bring uh, Kevin and Ellen up for more data eight. Uh, if you wanna ask me questions about infrastructure, happy to keep, I'm super passionate about it. There's also another panel tomorrow with more info. Um, Find this slide deck, it's on the web page, and you can click on the links in the slide deck. You can look at the handout, whatever is a good way for you um, to interact with all this stuff, yeah? Oh, if you go to the web page, data.berkeley.edu slash 2022 workshop, and then you go to schedule, and then if you scroll down schedule to get to infrastructure. Uh, there's the slide deck should be there and it should be shareable. Um, I'm going to move on. We have Kevin and Ellen who are the summer instructors of day to eight. <laughs> and they are here to give you a little bit more lecture, like in a more advanced lecture. So John started off with like, what's like an early lecture. And the idea here is like, we're now further through the semester. We want to do some more advanced topics. And the way it's going to do is they're going to give a little bit of lecture and then we'll do a coffee break and we'll come back and we'll do some lab. Like, let's try and do the programming part as well. Okay, let me get this set up for you. Uh, it turns out that you can touch the screen. Which oh, okay. 21st century. <laughs> um, I'm just using the up and downs. Uh, we are working with this owl. So if you come over here and um, you're a little, I'm going to take it down. Thank you. It was really funny. De Niro was like way off, but I think that's going to line up well for you. Yeah. Okay. 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 Turn it over. Awesome. All right. Hi, everyone. Um, thank you for the introduction. I'm Ellen. I have been involved with Data8 since my freshman year when I took it in the fall semester and I came right back and immediately immediately applied for core staff. So data aid has really framed my college career and ending it here, trying to bring it to new people is, I think it's a really great capstone. It's obviously made a huge impact on me. And I think that having some version of it accessible to students everywhere would be really excellent. Do you wanna? Yeah. Everyone, my name is Kevin. Um, just finished my master's here. Um, could, you know, couldn't say goodbye to Berkeley. I've been involved with data aid since sophomore year. I used to be a biology student and then I took data aid and then it's that stream way took my heart. And then ever since I've been involved with data science and data eight, I've also worked on the discovery scholars part. So college talked about scholars are on building a research curriculum at discovery as well. So yeah, super excited to share our insights with you all today. All right. So we're here to teach you guys the data eight version of linear regression. At this point in the semester, students have learned tables. They've learned basic Python. They've learned a lot about chance simulation, hypothesis tests. And they've even learned confidence intervals. But this is their first foray into prediction, into really um, 
predicting things for new data, which eventually leads into our baby version of machine learning, teaching them k-nearest neighbors. Um, so the first thing we show them is they've already seen standard units. And what we want to get out of this is that a number and standard units is can be thought of as converting a data point from its raw data point into how far away it is from the mean. Uh, this is really useful when working with data sets that are a vastly different scale. Um, the classic example we use is age versus salary. You can't compare those directly. So we teach students how to convert to standard units, um, which is also a great callback to mean and standard deviation, which is easily calculable in Python. The reason we need them to know standard units is because starting off, we teach linear regression. So we need students to have some sense of how to quantify the degree to which two variables are correlated linearly. Um, and that is the correlation coefficient, which we just call R because correlation coefficient is a lot of syllables. So this measures strictly linear association. Um, how close are two variables to being perfectly linearly correlated along a straight line, um, upwards or downwards? And there's a lot of nice properties we teach about R and don't really prove. So students can just take us at our word. Hopefully you guys do too. Um, it is based on standard units. It is calculated using standard units. The way we approach it is it really is intuitively linked to scaling the variables down and then doing math with them. The main properties we're gonna be using today and the main properties for the lab are that um, it is a number that is between negative one and one. If it is equal to one, then that is called a perfect linear association. The, if you were to scatter the two plot, the X and the Y variable, it would be a perfect straight line sloping up. On the other hand, if you get R is negative one, it would be a perfect straight line sloping down Perfectly, neg uh, perfectly negatively linearly associated. Finally, the last thing that is um, almost a really powerful thing is that if R is zero, that means that your two variables have no linear association whatsoever. We call this uncorrelated. And it's important to make the distinction between correlation and association. Two variables can be uncorrelated, but still have an association, just not linearly. For example, if you imagine a parabola, there is no linear association between two variables, but there is clearly some pattern, some association going on. So some examples of associations for students to get a sense. Um, this is the perfectly uncorrelated example. The best line you could draw to predict y from x would just be flat here. On the other hand, if we have a little bit of a correlation, you start to see that it's still mostly blob-like, but now it's tending upwards. Um, as you increase R closer to one, it starts to cluster closer and closer to that straight line. Closer. And then finally, 0.99, probably as good as you'll see in the real world. And then we also have a negative example for when there is a negative trend. So this is the correlation coefficient, which is probably the linchpin to the understanding of linear regression. To calculate it, we um, teach it just by a, almost a word definition, which students then put into code. Um, R is defined by taking X and Y, putting them in standard units. This gives us the nice property that R is between negative one and one taking the product of them. And by product, we mean for each x, y pair, for each dot on the scatter plot, multiply its x value by its y value. Um, you then take the average of that, and that is how we calculate r in this course. Um, if we had more time, I would love to go more into what we do with the correlation coefficient. It has great intuition. For example, um, why do we take the product? Well, if you imagine, um, we're in standard units. So being above zero means you're above the mean. Being below zero means you're below the mean. If two numbers are both above the mean, the product will be positive, so they'll positively contribute to R. If both are below the mean, their product of two negative numbers will still be positive, so it'll still positively contribute to the correlation. On the other hand, 
If you have X being above the mean and Y being below, their product is negative, leading to a negative correlation. If, you, if I went too quick with that, don't worry about it. There's a great notebook, which we'll show you later. The TLDR of this is that important to be in standard units, positive is positive association, negative is negative. Also, feel free to interrupt me if you have any questions. I am going at a, I would say, slightly faster speed than we teach this. This is about three lectures worth of content. So please, please, please stop me if I am unclear or if you want more emphasis on anything. This is the um, sort of setup for linear regression. Um, then we actually get into predicting. This is our example that we're going to be working with during this lecture. Um, which is if you take, it's pretty, I don't know, my parents did this when I was a kid. They told me how tall I was going to be. Um, if you take your parents' heights, it's a good way of predicting how tall the child is going to be as an adult. So here are those two variables in standard units. The x-axis, the variable we're going to use to predict, is the average of the parents' heights. And the y-axis is the child's final adult height. So looking at this, um, we can see that there's a moderate positive correlation. It, it's sloping upwards a little bit, which tells us that it would be reasonable to do linear regression. Something we emphasize a lot in this class is don't just go doing linear regression on every old data set. You have to actually make sure it's a good idea first. So we've checked that it's a good idea. Now, how do we actually do it? How do we predict the child's height from the parent's height? And the first thing we're going to show is actually not something we ask students to code up, but it's a good intuitive understanding. If I have a new data point, say this yellow guy, um, say I observe two parents whose average height is 68. A good thought might be that this child's height should be like the other children who had parents' average height like that. Um, so we look at all the data points that are either a parent height of 68 or within a little range because maybe there were no data points exactly at 68. And so we look at all these training points and we say, all right, the new child's height is probably going to be similar to all of these guys. By similar, we just take the average. So that yellow dot right there, I believe, is the average of all of these dots similar to 68. And if we do this for every possible x value, or I guess I think we do it for like every 0.5 steps, we can get what we call the graph of averages. Um, and this gives us a way of predicting. This is a pretty easy entryway into the area of prediction. All it requires you to believe is that new data points should act like old data points. Uh, we got lucky in that this kind of does look like a line, but it's not a perfect straight line. So we're not doing linear regression right now. We're doing the graph of averages, and that allows it to probably be more accurate in some areas as it kind of wiggles a bit. But it's not linear, and that means we don't have the nice properties that we're going to talk about for the rest of the lecture. So to do linear regression, the math behind it is that we have to decide what a good line is. Graph of averages, we don't have to think about this. At no point did I look at this and say, um, what makes this prediction better than this prediction? We just took the average completely hands off. To do linear regression, we need to decide which line is the best fit and how do you determine what a good fit is. So consider just a candidate line. I drew this line randomly, kind of going through it. Um, Suppose I suggest this line as the best fit line. What we can do is we can look at, for example, what would this line predict for a child's height when their parents average was 72? If we walk along the x-axis and go up to what the line predicts, I think it's about 72-ish. Yeah, 72. No, yes, 72. So, Using this line, we would predict the child's height to be 72. Now let's look at an actual data point that had parent average height 72. Suppose, yeah, there's our prediction. 
And let's look at this database. So this is a real set of people we observed. There were two parents that had an average height of 72 and their child's height was 67. So for this data point, we can calculate how wrong our prediction was. How off were we? Um, line predicts 72, it was actually 67. So we take the actual value minus the predicted value to get that the error for this point is negative five. Now, if we do that for every single blue point, if we see what is its actual value, what does the line predict? We can sum up all of those squared errors. We square the errors because if they're negative and they're positive, they'll cancel out and they'll be kind of useless. So what we want to do is we want to minimize the total squared error. And a really good visualization for this, let's see if I can find my mouse. My mouse on here? Oh my gosh, I remember now, thank you. <laughs> Perfect. So here's a really great simulation. Um, we'll just pick a random, now let's pick one that's actually linear. Here we go. So remember I talked about candidate lines? Here's where a really great web page that we encourage our TAs to use in discussion where they can literally make a candidate line themselves. So let me see, I think best fit might be like here-ish. And then you can visualize, um, Kevin's gonna talk more about residuals later. For now, just believe me that they're essentially errors. So here are all the actual errors and then we square them. And then the sum of all the areas of these red boxes is the total squared error, which we want to make small to get a good line. Um, and if, let's see, how do I, and yeah, it's um, one thing we like to do for students is we give them this web page. We ask everyone to make what their guess for the best fit line is, and then turn it on to see how wrong we really are. That's the intuition behind what we're trying to create. We want to create a line that is as good as possible at predicting the values that we know the answers for. As for how you do that mathematically and computationally, that I will hand it off to Kevin for. <laughs> All right, so what Ellen went over was building that intuition, right? We set up the students with a feeling and intuition about what correlation is. If you have two variables, what a linear association is. You have stronger linear associations, you have weaker ones. And then we also go into that definition of a good fit line. What is a good fit line? A line that minimizes the error, right? From like the points. So you want to minimize, you want to create a line that has low errors from the actual points. Your predictions need to follow that line. And now in data eight, we go a little deeper into that, you know, using the functions without actually proving it. And as Ellen talked about before, um, we give students that understanding of correlation. Correlation is a way of measuring that linear association. And what the properties are, if you put data into standard units, is that the mean is zero. Standard units, like a standard, you know, um, standard form of units, uh, the mean is zero and one, you, you basically divided by the standard deviation. And that's some really nice properties. As we can see, if, if you are drawing a linear regression line through, you know, data that's in standard units, it's always gonna go through the origin. You're gonna have a line that takes the form Y is AX. And students are normally used to that format because in high school and middle school, students are used to that, that intuition of a straight line with different slopes, right? Y is AX. And as we saw before, um, so the correlation R is a coefficient between negative one and one. It is that strength that we talked about earlier. But one is a positive association or a positive one that slopes upward and a negative correlation is one that slopes downward. And with that intuition, we ask students to draw the line that goes to that point of cuts, right? And if we have that, um, you know, when we have data that is measured in standard units, and when we describe the X values, you can think about the X values as, you know, how many standard deviations is a value. So for example, we had, you know, parents height and you no. Know, um, a child's height, and you're trying to predict the child's height. And we have the parent's height, and you normalize it, you use standard units, then a value of one would be corresponding to, oh, this person is one standard unit above the mean. 
That's what an X of one means if X is standard, is standard units. And this correlation coefficient, that's kind of how we build students, bring students into a linear regression, giving them this formula here. And the same way you can think about Y that same way. So the Y values, if you have them in standard units, they correspond you know, um, to how far it away is from the average. And this slide here does not only teach students how to create a linear regression line through, you know, in standard units, it also builds up that intuition to, you know, I know many of you guys have heard it before, but to it towards regression to the mean, right? A correlation coefficient is a value that is rarely one. In the real world, we always see strong correlations. They are almost one, maybe 0 0.8, 0 0.7. But what to regression to the mean basically means is that your correlation is going to be um, maybe like smaller than one, it might be 0.8 or 0.9 if you have real world data. And if you're making predictions um, that are, for example, I have a real, for example, my parent is really tall, so the input will be really tall. Um, and your correlation coefficient is never one. What happens is that your estimation is always going to be weaker because what's happening is that that correlation coefficient is always between negative one and one. So that is kind of regression to the mean that your predictions are regressing to the mean. They're being decreased in um, in magnitude, basically. And some example that Professor Adhikari sometimes uses, or like some TAs that they use, is thinking about this situation. For example, we are trying to predict a student's final score based on their midterm score. For example, I get two standard deviations above the mean for my midterm. So my, my data point in standard units would be two. Um, so what is happening, my correlation is 0.8, then my predicted final score is always gonna be lower. It's gonna be lower. Um, and therefore that is that regression to the mean effect. And that's where the name linear regression actually comes from. And we build up that intuition to it for students, but not really going too deep into you know, the theory behind it. So it's not true for all points, but it's like a statement you know, on averages. And then we also show students the formulas for, you know, thinking about linear regression in original units. Um, we gave them formulas earlier and we just showed them this. We don't go too much into the proofs behind it or the calculus, but students can work out. I've had occasionally students asking about, hey, how do we get these formulas? And it's not the focus of the class, focus class, applying these formulas and then trying to get a line. Um, in addition to that intuition that we built earlier about, you know, the residual study. And I'm going to go over a little demo. Let me see how this works. Should I? Let me see if this. It's working. All right, perfect. Yeah. And what we do after showing the students these equations is going over a demo, doing some live coding and kind of looking into these examples with real life data. So what we see here is we have a point cloud of correlation 0.7. These points, we wrote some functions before students don't need to write it. It's mainly to visualize you know, different lines that we can have and showing them that when we have a point cloud of 0.7, these point, this point cloud is in, like, is in standard units. And when we draw a line through that, that line is what you would normally expect to be uh, you know, the, the best fit line that you would be able to draw. And the one is just showing what a perfect correlation would look like. So that's the line of 45 degrees. And now we also look at real life data. So these functions here, uh, standard units, as Ellen said before, uh, you, you mean them, so you have a sequence of number x, you subtract it by the mean and then you divide it by the standard deviation. And the correlation is that product in standard units and then taking the average. So giving students that word definition of what a correlation is helps them understand and write that code as well, uh, which you guys will be doing in your lab as well. Yeah. Um, and then these formulas, we coded them already up um, to uh, speed up that process during le giving lecture, but students will be also influencing them themselves. So let's take a look at this data here. Um, we have 
parent average heights and children heights. And what we're trying to do here is we calculate the slope. The, it's super nice because we already calculate the slope based on the formulas that were given, the functions that were given earlier, and the intercepts. Um, and then we put them back into the table and then we draw them out. Um, and what we're trying to show here is this is some random line. As Ellen said before, sometimes we want to draw a bad line to let students or have them think about what a good line is. And then normally what I would do in class is show them like, okay, what is so bad about this line? And students normally would say like, oh, this line is too flat compared to a, a best fit line. And then thinking about where a good line would be. And then we showed the actual regression line based on these golden points through the functions that we you know, defined earlier. Yeah. Okay. Let me go back to the lecture. Yes, so these formulas, um, we just give them to students um, and then they can code it up to work that out in their lab. Um, and this is some recap. So students will understand that a line in regression line in standard units goes to the origin um, and has a slope of R. Um, and then when they convert back to our original units, um, it goes through the average of X and Y. Um, and also um, that they know that the slope is the correlation times the ratio of the standard deviations. These are just some formulas again. But also thinking we, we gave them the formulas, but we also want them to formalize that intuition no matter earlier. You know, when do we use linear regression? And that is another component of us teaching linear regression is having students understand when to use regression, doing running some diagnostics. How do we decide whether regression was the right, right way or linear regression was the right method of prediction? And that's where we use residuals or residual plot. And residual is just a word for the error. Basically, residual is you calculate it by taking the actual value minus the predicted value. You're seeing how wrong was my prediction based on the original value that we had. And we plot it out against the X values um, to show like, oh, what is going on here? And that's called a residual plot. And this residual plot, we just give it to students, but we tell them like, oh, it has to be an unassociated blob for linear relations. Because what you want is intuitively, you want your error to be equally bad for no matter points on either end, right? If I have a tall father or maybe I have like a short father or like mom, um, I want my error to be unrelated to whether my parent is tall or short. And that is the intuition that we're giving. Um, also, we're going to look at some examples, but residual plots also show nonlinear relations. Sometimes as Alan talked about, we have a parabola. And what students will see is if they run linear regression on that, then you will see it back in the residual plot. You will see that that maybe, you know, linear regression was not the right way of solving that issue earlier. Um, and as I said, you know, it's like a larger, a larger superset, right? Thinking about whether linear regression is appropriate or not. Um, and also looking for outliers, because outliers and spread changes and spread trends, patterns, thinking about what would have caused these errors, you know, to make a regression bad. That's kind of what we use residual plots for. And we'll go over a demo as well in this situation. Right. So these are some functions again, right? So residuals, um, so fitted values is a function that calculates the, the regression line. Um, and then residuals is the actual value minus the predictions that we had. Um, just making speeding it up and also we also give this uh, during lectures um and let's plot it for the situation here above um we create a regression line these golden points are the regression line that go through the point cloud both children height versus the parent average and if we run this um and we create a residual plot we see there's an unassociated blob um it's like a formless point of clouds it doesn't go up it doesn't go down um and what's happening is that it's equally spread out, right? And that is a good thing. We want students to understand that, that intuition that I talked about earlier, that you don't want the error of your line to depend on your parent's height. But there are also some other more interesting examples. Uh, for example, we also show the Dugong data set where we're trying to predict the, um, the length of a Dugong based on the age 
And if we plot it out, we have a correlation of 0.82. We see that the data slightly curves upward. Um, it's probably not an, like when students plot this out, they should be able to recognize that this is not a straight line. It's more curved upwards. It looks like a second degree order uh, kind of relationship. Um, but when they still do decide to use linear regression and we plot it out, students will get this kind of line, the line of best fit when they use the correlation to calculate it out. And through residual plots, what they will find out is this through residual plot, so the error plot, what students will find out is that some values when the length is low, predict give a higher residual. And higher residual means that your prediction underestimated the value. And then if you have negative value, um, which means that your prediction over predicted based on the uh, original value. And then once we go up again around the 2.6 area, we have positive residuals again. And this should give students that intuition of, oh, you know, it is good in the middle kind of, but then it's like bad. It just under predicts, it over predicts here. Uh, sorry, it under predicts here, over predicts there, and it under predicts again. And it tells them that, you know, probably linear regression was not the best way of solving this issue. Maybe we should have used some second order or higher order uh, linear, higher order regression method that they learned in later class and just setting them up for that intuition that this was not appropriate of doing. Yeah. So summary of functions that we had. Um, again, this is just, you know, we start with the regression or correlation coefficient, and then we slowly just give them all the formulas that they need in order to understand it more deeply rather than focusing on derived functions. Um, and later for the lab, we're also going to give you guys all these formulas so you, you can follow along uh, with coding it up and everything. <laughs> Any questions for Ellen and me? Um, you mean like in the lecture that we did yeah, here? Exactly. Yeah, exactly. Right. So what we do in the textbook is we show them like, oh, this is a concept and we show some blocks of code for students to play around with. But during lecture, we want to introduce that to students. And we also modify a little bit um, to build a, lot, a little bit more intuition since it's a completely, like it's a more new topic that they need as well. You want to add something? I would say the textbook is really intended to be pretty complete so that if a student is struggling on homework, they can always find the code that is similar to their problem. Whereas lecture, we like to think that the students want to hear our thoughts on it, want to hear the perspective of someone with a lot of experience. So we try to tend away towards strict coding and more explaining so that they can go to the textbook later and reference the code part. Yeah, thank you for the question. Anything else on how we teach this lecture stuff? Yes. How much training do you guys have to do be <laughs> um, four years. <laughs> so, well, so, to get in front of the class, it's basically only seniors that are that are teaching or, or lecturing. We actually have um, a really great pipeline of Data Eight. So, students usually take the course, then they volunteer as a lab assistant for one semester. And so, in a lab with thirty students, but with a TA, they answer questions, but they always have someone to fall back on. After that, they become a tutor. Um, most students are tutors for two to three semesters. This involves them working in small group environment, five to six students, and they're unsupervised doing this. They've already been a lab assistant. We know they know how to teach. Let's give them a small group of students they're responsible for. Um, staff members who do well as tutors then get promoted to TAs. If you are a TA and you are available the summer after, <laughs> um, you might get invited to teach. And we're not sure. Yes, exactly. Yes. All righty. I think we have a, a, we're a little early, so 20 minute break. Yeah, there's yeah. really good cookies <laughs> <laughs> well, over here. Yeah, then we'll see you back at 315 for the last portion. <laughs> Really?
I think it's more normally in data science called standardization. So average your data around zero and then one standard deviation per time. So we teach them earlier in the course um, about what standard units are. So it's like subtracting the mean divided by the standard. Cool. I just would have to take one of these meetings. 
Yeah, so I, I was the one that kind of pushed them to try to start testing, and then they 